Hi everyone, I am Daniel and I just finished playing Return to the Circle Undone with Skids O'Toole. Just one investigator. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences playing True Solo for one of the first times through an entire campaign and my experiences there and maybe some tips for all of you who are interested in playing True Solo. Granted, I played one investigator and it was Skids and I don't have experience with other investigators. So what I say here is going to be a little bit limited to my experiences with him. So with that caveat out of the way, I had a great time with Skids. Uh, when I first announced that I was doing this and, and played it on the, the channel, a lot of people looked at this and said, this seems like a joke. <laughs> uh, Circle Undone, which requires a lot of willpower tests. Skids, two willpower. What am I thinking? And he's generally regarded as one of the weaker investigators in the game. So. <laughs> How did it go? It went really well. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm still sort of smiling because I'll, as I'll talk about it, it went surprisingly well and I had a lot of fun with some kind of janky interactions with the game. But while it surprised me a lot at the beginning, as I was playing through the campaign and you know continuing my true solo experience, it stopped surprising me because the things I was doing really matched up with what the game was giving me. So um, that something I'll talk about a little bit more. So Skids has this flat stat line, and I think that's really good in true solo. I think he can do a lot of things. The extra action that he can pay for, uh, traditionally people say this is outclassed. I understand why, but actually I use this quite a bit. I think it's quite good. And the Elder Sign effect, plus two if you succeed, gain two resources, is fantastic. With a large card pool, something I'll go back to as well later, you can do a lot with skits. You can do a lot with the stat line. His zero to two guardian access along with zero to five rogue is fantastic. And uh, if you haven't given him a try in a while, whether it's solo or in multiplayer, uh, please do try to think of some cool things you can do and you can follow some of my leads. What I'm gonna do is talk about five or six, seven, seven different tips. Uh, that I have, or things that I learned anyway, from playing True Solo, and then I'll do a retrospective on his deck uh, itself. Okay. So the first thing is action economy is key when playing True Solo. This makes a lot of sense. There is no one else to help you, but if you can help yourself by having more than three actions a turn, then you can get a lot done and you can overcome things like failing tests or when the game decides to take things away from you or you know something that you, is unexpected happens, right? Uh, being able to finagle some extra actions is very powerful. Now, I stopped short of calling this action compression because while getting two clues at once can be very powerful in multiplayer and something you strive for, it's not that important here. It can be. Uh, dealing multiple damage with weapons is still important, but kind of less so than um, in normally. What you want to do is be able to pass your tests, and you may need to do things that are different actions, not just the same action more than once. So compressing, say, different kinds of actions into one action is actually really good. So uh, deduction, good card, useful, but there aren't that many locations with two clues. But if you can combine getting one clue with dealing one damage, then things look a lot better. When I get to the deck list, I'll show you and talk more about uh, Alice Luxley. I think he exemplifies the true solo experience uh, really, really well, especially in Skid. So uh, my, my tip here is to think about how you can get more than just your three actions. A lot of investigators come with this built in. Skids obviously can just pay for uh, an extra action to do anything, which Again, starts to look really good when you don't know what that thing might be, but lots of investigators can get some equivalent of this. Um, getting extractions with allies or um, other kinds of cards, also really good. All right, tip number two, expect few enemies. Other than elites that have to show up basically from the story, you don't know how many enemies are going to show up in the uh, particular scenario that you play. Traditionally, it's about one third or less, maybe closer to 30% of the encounter deck will be an enemy. And if you have, say, 30 to 40 cards in the deck and maybe 15 turns at most in a scenario, it's very possible you only draw a couple of enemies. Now, you should expect the big enemy, the elite, but they don't tend to have as much health with uh, only one player. Four per investigator looks a lot different 
if you are only one investigator and you only need to do all four damage. It's not that hard to do because you're saving essentially your ammo or skill cards or whatever it might be for that moment. When you have two players and that same enemy has eight health, you need to think about how you can keep dealing damage um, over multiple turns, right? And things look a lot different if you can solve elite enemies in one turn, in which you can definitely do in solo and you should plan on that. Uh, for the As for the other enemies, I spent a lot of time with no enemies on the board. And it was kind of weird because there were a lot of things I wanted to do with enemies. And I, sometimes I needed to keep them around for that reason or you use the uh, elite enemies for that purpose. But um, I had two weapons in this deck, an enchanted blade and a level two survival knife. I think I had one more, but I dropped it fairly quickly because I did not need it. You don't need the ammo. You don't need uh, <laughs> to do that much damage to these guys. And this is partly because Skids himself can evade. Dealing extra damage with Alice Luxley helps, of course, uh, other kinds of cards that I put in. But this is, does not need to be your giant game plan of how do I deal with hordes of enemies coming at me because they're not going to show up. Now, yes, sometimes they do. And then you don't want to be like, I just lost because uh, there is a swarm of enemies and I don't know how to deal with them. But you can rely on some other tricks for this. Here's the other part of why I recommend evading and walking away if you can. If the, Even if the enemies have hunters, sometimes you can just get away and get even further away and they won't ever bother you. Your time is better spent advancing the act deck. Getting clues, mm, revealing locations, moving around, that kind of stuff. If you can do that on your turn instead of spending three actions trying to fight an enemy, that's way better. So uh, as much as I say expect few enemies, the ones that you that do show up, you don't need to put all of your effort into getting them off of the board. The board, as I'm going to talk about, does not fill up very quickly. With only one thing that you draw every turn, there's usually very few obstacles. So that's something I learned and wasn't expecting exactly. So number three, this is exactly what I'm talking about here. I sound like an idiot saying expect few enemies and then expect few treacheries. But the point here is that the board does not fill up. <laughs> you just don't put that many things on uh, from after the mythos phase onto the board. So there's a little bit less resistance than you expect. In other words, at the beginning of a lot of investigator phases, when I'm playing two or three or four players, it's kind of like damage control. Look around and see what the problems that suddenly popped up from the mythos phase are and how do we deal with them? If your job is to fight enemies, then there might be two enemies or three enemies or more to deal with. And they are, you know, things that you need to solve before anyone else can do anything at all. In solo, often the treacheries that pop up are just going to happen and do nothing. You can get basically a totally free mythos phase several times per, uh, per game. And that's wild to me. You can draw a card that just, you know, maybe deals you one damage or one damage and a horror, and that's all you get. And you say, cool, I can continue along with my game plan. That just doesn't happen that often in a uh, two or three player. So the other reason I say expect few treacheries is because sometimes when you know campaigns and scenarios very well, what happens is you're very worried about certain kinds of treacheries showing up. You're very um, susceptible to say an agility treachery or a willpower treachery or something that deals a bunch of damage to your allies or, or whatever it might be that really hurts you. And what you do sometimes is you put in a few cards that are going to solve that problem. Not saying that you don't need to do that in true solo, but the probability of you drawing any of those particular treacheries is very low. So it is very likely that you play some scenarios without seeing you know, half of the encounter deck. And if there are multiple copies of certain cards that you don't like to see, you know, maybe you'll only see one of them. Probably you won't see both and very often you won't see either. So, uh, it's just something that I was less expecting to be, uh, happening where I was like, not very scared of the encounter deck. Again, the skids build I had seemed to be pretty resistant to treacheries in general, but I, I would say that it shouldn't be your game plan to, uh, be scared of the encounter deck too much because your time is better spent doing things during your turn than stuffing your deck with ways to uh, shore up those sorts of weaknesses. 
Again, you need to be able to do everything, a little bit of everything, but I found that I was very worried about drawing certain things and then I never did. All right, thing number four, play your game. Think about what your deck wants to do, what your investigator wants to do, especially. You're the only one playing, you need to rely on that investigator's strengths more than anything else. So I kind of went in thinking, when playing true solo, I need to adapt a little bit more to the fact that there aren't that many clues on the board. Enemies are a little bit scarier since there's no one else to help out. I'm susceptible to which cards are in my hand. I thought I might need to put more skill cards in. And then I quickly realized that that is not how I wanted to play the game. And I wanted to play the game the way that I thought skids could best win. Not to say that I built it exactly like a two or three player deck, but it wasn't that far off. It is very possible that's because I was playing a rogue and rogues do certain things that they always want to do, especially regarding uh, evasion and, and card draw and whatnot. Um, but it was also spilled over into the gameplay. I also felt like I should have a lot of pressure moving quickly through scenarios so I wasn't drawing as many encounter cards or enemies. Um, but I also scrapped that plan and said, look, my strengths in this deck are to play assets. Again, people have always said, no, too many assets slows you down, more skill cards, et cetera, et cetera. But that wasn't really what I thought was going to make me win. So I wanted to play my game. Often at the beginning of scenarios, I was just drawing cards and playing them because I didn't think that drawing any of the particular treacheries or enemies was going to derail my plan. I could just evade an enemy and maybe that would actually be helpful if I had an enemy out, as you'll see from the deck list. So I realized that, you know, I, with a moment I, I would I would deviate from how I wanted to play the game was when I would run into, tr into trouble, not taking advantage of the strengths that I actually had. So that's probably true of like most player counts, but I felt that it would be more scary at true solo in this vein and it didn't happen. All right, the next couple of <laughs> the next couple of tips here are, uh, you know, if you know something about it's, it's not good advice. These are just things that I learned. Um, if you know something about the scenario and the campaign, you can dramatically change your play style and your your plan while you're actually playing the game. So I'm not gonna say like if you play true solo, you're totally hosed if you are playing for the first time a campaign or scenario but it's going to be much harder. It, this is always the case in the game, knowing the scenario, what happens when you flip the act or agenda, um, anticipating the kind of challenges the um, game is gonna throw at you. This is always gonna be true, but I think it's even more so in true solo where I could focus on my, my game plan and just think about, okay, if I go here, then I know this will happen. So <laughs> my advice is don't be afraid to restart a scenario or campaign if you're playing true solo because it is challenging enough to figure out how to play somewhat optimally and knowing what's coming is helpful it won't of course always be perfect because there's still so much randomness in the game what encounter cards you draw uh, what tokens you draw random locations that sort of thing always going to be part of the game i mean i replay campaigns all the time it's still very fresh to me and because still things are unpredictable but removing some of the gotcha moments from the campaigns can make the scenarios a lot easier of course and maybe a lot uh feels a lot better i think as a player number six is another one that's not good advice it's just we know that having access to lots and lots of cards is going to make things a lot easier it kind of goes back to skids right people have this memory of playing him with just a core set and he was total garbage right I admit this, that uh, he doesn't make sense with the cards that came out, even in the first couple of cycles. Now, with, I don't know, 10, 10 different cycles out, there's a lot for him. And they, especially the last three, have, they've recently come out with things that just make more sense for what he wants to do. If you envision this sort of evade, stealth, fight kind of uh, investigator, he's he actually has that. And some people who have said, oh, um, I kind of wish he had four combat and four agility and, and not uh, three uh, 
well, not two willpower and three intellect. I, I get it, uh, but I actually like his stat line a lot. He can make use of the intellect. He can make use of the willpower just fine with the right cards. Having a big card pool solves the problem. So I think true solo gets a lot easier, again, with a good plan and having lots of choices to, of what to put in your deck. Well, again, I'll show you mine at the end of this video. Not good advice, but it is very true. If you've watched any of my videos with skids, I got really, really lucky for a lot of different reasons. One reason, which is absurd, and you're going to say, how can you possibly give advice on true solo when this happened? <laughs> yeah. um, and I fully admit, possibly one of the reasons why I got so much uh, done in these scenarios and a lot of XP is I got lucky. And that's kind of the solo experience, I think. And it, it can be, this is why I say restart scenarios, that's okay. But it can be the case that a lot hinges upon certain tests, failing certain tests, uh, getting ahead in the game by having an Eller sign that gives you extra resources, which is basically an extra action. You can do a lot more. So I'm not going to say it's it's uh, impossible to lose when you draw <laughs> 29 Elder Signs in a campaign, but sometimes it just felt like Skids was charmed. So when you're playing True Solo, there's no one to back you up. Sometimes it's just the case that the way out is to just draw good. And the, I mean, there's a lot to be said for this, right? Especially playing on standard difficulty, which I do. Sometimes taking a risk on a test because you're fairly likely to pass, forget the elder sign, just a zero is fine, right? Is worth doing rather than not, right? Uh, if it'll get you out of a tough spot, being able to evade an enemy, um, do the damage to the enemy, maybe being a little more conservative because you just don't have the actions uh, to worry about it later or your cards, right, is the wrong idea. You just kind of, I don't want to say be reckless, but you sometimes you just take the test and say, uh, there's a 60 or 70% chance of passing, just do it. And sometimes you get rewarded for it <laughs> by getting extra resources. That happened with me. Okay. Those are just some things I learned. Again, the first three or four might be pieces of advice. They might not be. The last three are just things that uh, you get used to once you've played the campaigns a little bit more and realize what happens. So maybe, of course, you've played lots more true solo than I have, and you have some different advice, or you think that I've said things that are wrong. But I also put the caveat that this is pretty much for the deck that I played. Although I think I would play very similar decks to this in true solo because it worked very well. So now let me show you a couple of different versions of the deck that I played. So the first one I'm going to show you is, I would say the, it's not the original deck. It is the deck that I took after scenario number two. I'm not going to give you other spoilers for what happened in the campaign, but I will show you that uh, this is the, the deck from after scenario one. I, after I put Underworld Market in. It's a Underworld support deck, so there's one of everything, which may not be optimal, but I felt like I wanted to have lots of different options, and this deck was mostly built around uh, two things, parlaying and using the Survival Knife and Stealth, which is not yet in the deck. There is an old uh, Skids Stealth Survival Knife deck that I took inspiration from, and it came from before... All of these new tricks came about, so uh, there's I mean, not everything else worked with it perfectly, but I think it still was good. The other part that is important is I playing True Solo. I didn't see any reason not to take uh, Karen's Obel because just taking two XP every scenario um, was important for me to get more head on the game. And as you'll see for the second version of this, I'll show going into the finale. I had 60 XP. And if you're not beating the game with 60 XP, then, you know, something truly has gone wrong. Uh, but getting there, of course, was uh, not always easy. I know the campaign, I know Return 2 is a lot easier on uh, an investigator like Skids because he can pass a more agility test. There aren't as many uh, willpower ones. Um, so I felt like this was the right call. It still was something I was worried about in the scenarios that didn't have a an easy resign option, which I never use. I never actually ended up resigning anywhere. 
Okay. So the British Bulldog is one of these uh, items that I, I never played. I don't think I ever did. I, it may have popped up in my hand, but I don't think I ever played it. I don't think it's a bad card. I just didn't feel like I needed it, which is strange. Like it has a pretty good effect, but with one survival knife and one enchanted blade that I always got to basically, I was fine for the entire campaign. So you'll see a bunch of other things in here. I needed to have 10 uh, illicit cards and I did. I had disguise. I don't think I ever played it. It was just filling up the underworld market. The embezzled treasure though, I did have until the very end. I am showing you this like somewhat starting deck because it's in here and it's not in the last one. This card is bonkers. Even just one copy of it. Um, and it kind of eats up Skids' resources as, as well as his uh, weakness, possible debts, which also I drew every single game. Um, this is a bunch of resources, 16, I guess, uh, up to 16 that I, I threw away. But starting with extra resources, the following turn, uh, scenarios is a strong effect that I uh, really cannot underestimate. It's, it's really good. Other things here. Um, let's just bring up Alice a little bit larger on the screen so you can see her. This was a big part of the game plan. One copy, but I tended to find her more often than not. She gave me plus one intellect, which was good with the fake credentials that we'll talk about next. And then this idea of discovering a clue, dealing one damage to an enemy is really strong because if I only needed to do two damage to an enemy, one could have been with the survival knife and one could have been with Alice Luxley. Here's one of those few things that skids can do that say Tony Morgan can't. So this was almost like my vicious blow or something, I guess, which I had in the deck too. Um, but yeah, I, I made use of this all the time. It's a really strong card. I think people sleep on it. It makes more sense in the skids deck because you can evade enemies or parlay with enemies while you're engaged with them and then do some damage. Okay, um, anything else I want to talk about in the level zero? Level zero. Not really. You can see I did have eight skill cards, which is a bit higher than I had later because I upgraded them into, I think, better things. Um, but, you know, the perception, the overpower, the unexpected courage, they're, they're all fine cards to, to have, uh, but I did start getting rid of them. So let's move on to, oh, wait, uh, let's talk about the fake credentials here too. This is the level zero version. I did upgrade it. I thought the level zero version is fine. It's not going to do a whole lot, but in true solo, getting one clue is, um, I'm not going to say enough, but it was probably fine for the fact that this exhausts. Getting one clue at your location, I had fine clothes in the deck for quite some time, so this never really became more than difficulty zero. But with Alice, it kind of made this a little bit easier to make sure I passed by enough. I like this being a low um, difficulty test because it started to trigger things that were based on succeeding by a bunch, uh, like Lucky Cigarette Case, or, uh, well, not watch this, but maybe other things that came down the line that I wanted to, to succeed by, by more than just a few. So I think it's a good card. You do want to upgrade it, which I did. So here is the upgraded version of everything. <laughs> this is 60 XP. So. Uh, almost everything got upgraded, but not everything. You can see that Lone Wolf made it in here uh, along with Stylish Coat, which basically gave me two extra resources every turn. This, mm, basically one of those resources went back into drawing a card from the Underworld Market, which I think is a really good way to um, to make sure you get these extra cards in hand, which are, are fantastic. Um, some of the other uh, level zero events went uh, we got a snitch, I think, that went in for eavesdrop. I took out the scene of the crime as well. Um, again, you don't need to get that many clues, but the snitch, I, I want to say I played it a few times. It. I wanted to say that I wanted it to be better than it was, but it did get me out of a couple of tough spots because it was fast. So I think it's a neat upgrade from something like scene of the crime if you are parlaying. Honestly, the only two things I was parlaying with was the fake credentials, and check out this upgrade, uh, test zero. And if you don't succeed by one or by two or more, that's when you add the suspicion. So the fine clothes keeps this at uh, zero for quite some time. And then the discover one clue at your location or a connecting location. <laughs> uh, there are more than one scenario where I, I'm not gonna say I cheesed it because it's part of the card, but I just sat somewhere with an enemy and 
just got clues off of connecting revealed locations. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I took that many move actions because of this card. It's really strong. It doesn't exhaust. It's really easy to succeed by a bunch. And like I said, it feeds into something like Alice. Crazy. I went down to one ally. I was not worried about taking damage or horror. I had some other soak here, things like Moxie. I did have the second wind to heal the in the thick of it damage that I had, um, which is a good card. I think this is a fine option for, um, you know, if you worry about that sort of thing, which I, I do. Um, that was one way to parlay and then Grift. You know Grift. Grift is good. Um, it's a strong card if you are planning on having enemies around. The other part of this story, as I mentioned a while ago, is Stealth 3. Again, this plan was evade the enemy, you disengage with it, you don't exhaust it, it can't engage you until the enemy phase when it will then punch you. You react to that with a survival knife and kill them. Now, that loop did not materialize that much. But what did materialize is the fact that this is kind of an extra action. <laughs> uh, it's easy to use pickpocketing off of it. The dirty fighting is kind of a nombo with this because it doesn't exhaust the enemy, but it still gives you the extra action if you want to fight it anyway. You can still fight the enemy that you've stealth. I did not realize that because, you know, just was not obvious to me that you can still fight it if it wasn't engaged with you. If you're playing multiplayer, this doesn't make that much sense. The enemy probably then immediately engages someone else, but getting it off of your back so you can play cards, get clues, just walk away um, without getting a tax opportunity is quite good. Like I said at the very beginning, action economy is key. This was basically an extra action to evade, plus making it really easy to evade. I use this on elites. Doesn't say anything about non-elites. It's actually a strong card. Um, what else is in here? I put fence in. Uh, I think this is pretty good also to get the underworld market stuff going better. It's hard to pull it out of the underworld market. If it doesn't happen at the beginning, then it's maybe not worth it. But I think the card is good. Um, it's not the best, but I didn't want to put Leo De Luca in my ally slot. I didn't want to spend uh, XP on a charisma, although I could have. This, I think, does the trick for this deck. It's found a home, I think, with the underworld market. Having 10 illicit things is good. One fun thing you can do is with bank job, you can use uh, fence to reduce the cost by an action, which is good. Okay. Other thing I want to talk about. Oh, you can do some cute things with stealth and dynamite blast. I may not have done it more than once, but one of the ways to solve the uh, enemy problem is to just blow them up. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, it's a good card. The level two version is a little bit cheaper, so it's easy to afford, easy to afford. I wish I'd put more economy in this deck earlier, um, but I didn't. I only put the thieves kit in at the very end and I should have put it in earlier. I was getting worried about the fake credentials not really working when there weren't enemies around. So that's why I put it in at the end. Uh, the card is just very strong in someone like Skids. Uh, I don't think I can say much more than that. Uh, so I started adding more economy at the end. In I probably should have put it in earlier. But that said, uh, this deck was really good. Oh, uh, Ever Vigilant. You might say, you're putting it into a deck that doesn't have Stick to the Plan? Yeah. A lot of assets here. You always draw probably one from the Underworld Market. This went off, I would say, almost every time. The card is really good. You are saving three resources in two actions. Action economy is key. Getting stuff into play was really helpful early. If you're not playing an asset heavy deck, you know, fine, you don't need it. But uh, I think this started to solve the problem that many people have with the idea of having too many assets, especially in solo. Uh, that might be all, well, don't need to talk about that, right? It's good. That might be all I need to talk about though for the rest of this uh, video. Feel free to, you know, look carefully at everything on the, uh, the screen here, but uh, I made use of basically everything. I tried to play every single card and use all the skills. So it was a fun time, you know, using everything at my disposal 
made for a very enjoyable experience. And playing one ofs for everything is not always the most optimal, but when you've got some really good card draw and you have a plan of just trying to get to all your cards, it's not a bad idea. In fact, I will go as far as to say that including cards like Moxie and High Roller for just ways to pass tests. Um, it is better to include these sorts of cards and some of the skills um, than cards that don't do that. <laughs> cards that, you know, do something cute. You don't need to do that in, in, in True Solo. You need to have multiple ways of passing tests. And I like them on assets because it's repeatable. Every turn, you have a way of doing this. Dirty Fighting, right, gives you a plus two. High Roller gives you a plus two. Moxie gives you a plus one to a couple of stats, but plus more if you put some resources into it, plus the soak, plus it's free and fast. It's a good card. Uh, those sorts of things help you win the game rather than other things that are a bit more fleeting. I don't have a problem with like one or two healing cards. They're helpful. But uh, I, I realized that having all of these cards and using them propelled me through all the scenarios more than I was expecting. Have we talked about Wolf Mask yet? No? I didn't see it all the time, but it's really good. <laughs> it's really good in skids. Those are also plus twos. All right. That was my deck. I hope you enjoyed my little retrospective. I had a great time. I don't know if this, all the stuff I talked about was particular to rogues or skids. I want to try this again with another investigator, probably a mystic, but I very much enjoyed playing true solo. And if you haven't done it in a while, and especially not with the full card pool, I recommend trying it out and taking uh, some of these tips to heart. Of course, I'm no expert in this. I know how to play the game, but I don't know how to play every campaign with every other investigator in, in solo, but this worked for Return of the Circle and done. All right, I'll talk to you another time for another campaign in the future.